Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Oraculos True Divination Podcast, where I bring you ancient wisdom for the modern mystic. I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, and joining me today is Dr. Jen Zart. Jen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Jen, I am so happy to finally be able to sit down and talk with you because I feel as if we have so much in common and we never actually get a chance to sit down and talk. So I'm really excited about this interview today. Yeah, I'm very happy to. (laughs) Awesome sauce. So Jen, I met you at UAC in 2018 where I attended two of your talks, one of which was on the Al Mutant within astrology and another was on triplicity rulers in astrology. And today you're going to be talking a little bit about that with us. So I'm really excited. But before we go into that, Jen, you have such a diverse background as not just an astrologer, but also as a scholar. So can you tell our audience a little bit, not just even about your astrological work, but about your full educational background and how you made your way to being an astrologer today? Sure. Yeah. It all started in 15 when I got, when I was 15 and I got grounded. So so not in 2015, but when you (laughs) were 15. No, no, (laughs) no. When I was actually 15, I I disobeyed my parents and they grounded me for six months. It was pretty extreme. Wow. But thank goodness Saturn was on my moon and it took (laughs) six months for that transit to get out, you know, get away. So I I hunkered down in place and, you know, Mm -hmm. the first day it hit, I went to my German teacher who I was very close with and he happened to be an astrologer, but he was in the closet about it. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I just got grounded. My life is over. (laughs) And he said, when were you born? Where? What time? And can you go to Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon? (laughs) And so I said, I told him the data. And then he said, when you go to Powell's, get these books. And that was literally the only place my mom would let me go because she's like, well, let's do if she reads while she's grounded, (laughs) right? Well, I started rating their astrology section and after school before i get you know get get to go home i would ask him all these questions like what does it mean to have venus here and what is a house system and they had also taken away my computer so i had to calculate charts by hand so for six months i had this really hardcore you know oral (laughs) early transmitted mentorship one-on-one with an expert astrologer and that lasted for another 15 years actually that relationship just unfolded and i learned about mundane astrology secondary progressions and all of this and eventually found my way to traditional astrology um, with a separate teacher later amazing Um, and so the other thing that he was doing at that time was designing the curriculum for the Kepler College of Arts and Sciences in Seattle. So I was like, oh, you're going to make a college of astrology? I have to go. <laughs> and I, they weren't accredited when it came time for me to go to college. And so my parents were like, you have to go to a real school. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, well, I'll just go to NYU where I did go to Mm-hmm. But the entire time, every single class I took, I was always talking about astrology to the point where my professors were like, what's wrong with her? This isn't academic. What's, why does she keep talking about astrology? And I was like, it can be academic. It's just <laughs> prejudice. You guys have a really broken peer review system. You don't even know why you're letting, like, keeping it out of the academy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow, I get really into it. So then I, I decided Go for it. Okay, I was always wanting a PhD. Mm-hmm. And remember German teacher teaching me astrology I was like okay I'll just get a PhD in German but I'll mm-hmm. write it about astrology and culture and the beauty the beauty in that is that if you go to a history program they're going to ask you about questions of validity is astrology true right or or, or mm-hmm. how did it appear in history that there's always going to be this weird question or prejudice around like its validity as a, as a subject matter mm-hmm. and anthropology is a little more forgiving and yet it's treating it a little like with a 10, 10 foot pole of like well they do it Let's right. look at them like they're lab rats and just right. kind of see how they do it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but a literature department is all about fiction. So it doesn't matter if anything's true. It just matters, like, what's the story, you know? Yeah, so what's going yeah. On it? <laughs> so it became clear to me that actually astrology is a fundamental, uh, at the heart of it, a humanly created storytelling technology based upon observable, predictable data. Mm -hmm. So every human culture has been able to create stories about the sky Mm -hmm. using things that seem to repeat or not. You know, Mm -hmm. there's also chaotic astrologies that use weather patterns and comets. Yeah. Um, And so, yeah. And I just continued to infuse astrology in every class and medieval German had a lot of interesting astrology that Mm -hmm. not many people had brought out into the surface um, because not many astrologers were taking a degree in 
German literature. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, that kind of just unfolded. And then at some point in the middle of my graduate education, I had been, you know, even though I brought up astrology as a topic in class, I had felt closeted as an astrologer professionally. Mm -hmm. So in 2012, I came out of the closet and started doing, taking my career as an astrologer more seriously because I realized that I wasn't going to become a career academic. That... And then I enrolled <laughs> after in another degree in Nick Campion's master's degree in the Sophia Center, um, where I wow. could have a degree that said master's in cultural astronomy and astrology. And it was really wow. important for me to do that because there are many states in the United States that won't let you teach something unless you have a degree in that subject. That's amazing. And so this degree in Wales actually is a is a weird like um, what do you call it a loophole, right? Is yeah, that it? yeah, it is. That, that actually you could say I can teach astrology in your high school because <laughs> I have a master's degree in astrology, and they can't actually stop you, right? Wow. They, that's their one sort of gatekeeping. It's like, well, that doesn't exist, and it's like, well, now it does. <laughs> so <laughs> that's in my back pocket, and I'm thinking, you know, okay, one day that'll break out, you know. So. That is absolutely amazing, Jen, and I I love how your initial thing that you wanted to study in university was astrology because I think that so many of us we want in our youth to really actualize these studies whether it's mysticism or spirituality or whatever we want to actualize them in something that is recognized on a university level and then our parents tell us like no you're gonna go to be a journalist or no you're gonna go and get a real degree and yeah. and that was kind of my story as well so I just really loved that I mean I also got grounded it wasn't for six months it was for a year whoa whoa <laughs> I got grounded for a year because I pierced my ears <gasps> and <laughs> wow thank god for that piercing yeah 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 I got grounded <laughs> for a year I pierced my ears and I must have been I did dare say 13 or something and it was in that year that I went gung-ho into astrology as well so I love the way in which our astrological histories are tied in with punishment and <laughs> no right <laughs> well it's a Saturnian discipline so you it, know <laughs> it, was, it most definitely is all right now Jen a, another point that I didn't intentionally mean to ask you about but I'm gonna ask it is where do you think uh, certification and accreditation really stands within the greater astrological framework because you and I have both been astrologers a long time before either of us was certified or actually had a degree to prove it so where yeah. do you think within the larger astrological framework something like receiving a degree in astrology or a certification in astrology actually fits I think I think we're talking about a number of strategies of legitimizing this practice mm -hmm. and it it rests upon a respect for a certain type of legitimacy right mm -hmm. so the idea of getting a PhD in astrology says that I, I value PhDs mm -hmm. right? I value the club of getting a PhD Mm -hmm. I say most PhDs are actually not showing anything about the intelligence of the owner. It's more about the obedience of the owner because right. you have to show up for eight plus years right. and do what someone else tells you to do. And if you do it correctly, then they will allow you to get that title. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more about obedience than intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that there aren't intelligent people who have them, but it, I was shocked when I found out that there are many people who have them because they showed up. And that mm -hmm. was a little irritating to me. Um, on a, on a, com a professional level, in terms of our community, getting certified by a nonprofit in the United States, there are a number of nonprofits that award certification. There's mm -hmm. also a number of individual astrologers who award certification. Right. Uh, a lot of times this is an interesting kind of gatekeeping. So if I look at and I see like a certification program that is using humanistic astrology, I actually don't care to be certified by them because I'm not interested in becoming a humanistic astrologer. Mm -hmm. I know what it's about and I know mm -hmm. how to do that. I don't care about having a credential behind my name for that. Mm -hmm. I take that a lot more of a cowboy way where, you know, it's kind of like a, all right, I'm doing the work. And then this is also going back into the lineage of the German tradition. So in the Weimar Republic, this is talking about, you know, 1919 until 1933. Mm -hmm. In Germany, you have multiple different organizations sprouting up, including an organization that only let astrologers in who had PhDs. And wow. then you had a lot of other people who never got to go to university, especially female astrologers, who were very good and very published. And so they said, well, we're no less of a good astrologer. You know, we just don't have a university degree. And 
we actually see clients. We publish horoscopes. What are you doing? You know, you're studying this from, you know, a, a six foot remove and, and you're not actually in the trenches, like actually mm -hmm. doing the techniques and seeing people, helping people. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole spectrum of things. So to circle back to your original question, I think some people need the structure of a certification program to discipline them to become a good astrologer mm -hmm. and others do not. And I don't think having or not having a certification matters. I think paying attention to the quality of astrology matters. Right. And on a deeper level, this is, this is like where it actually comes to the pay dirt, right? Can the person talking to you about astrology name their ancestors in astrology? Can they name the lineage mm -hmm. that they're coming from? If they can't do that, then I have a red flag raise. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if they say my lineage is, I went to the NCGR certification program, I go, cool, I know what kind of astrologer you are. If someone mm -hmm. else says, I went to a Chuta Baba Dasha's program, Nightlight Astrology, cool, I know what kind of astrologer that person is. If someone mm -hmm. just says, I just taught myself, I'm going, oh, oh, oh really? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. What books did you read then if you taught yourself? Because that's also a lineage. And if they can't tell me, then I'm like, well, that's an interesting thing, right? And I, I get a bit wary about that. Mm -hmm. um, the other problem is with academic certification, everything I did at the Sophia Center was treating astrology more as a historical phenomenon, as an anthropological phenomenon, mm -hmm. was not so much about transmitting technique or how to counsel anyone in, in person right. or write a horoscope. So right. there's a kind of functional professional knowledge that's not transmitted in the halls of academia. Mm -hmm. And and so, and then there comes this larger question beyond certification, which is to say, why do we want the masses to know how to do astrology? I don't think astrology wants that. If you treat astrology like a sentient creature, it actually has created, with the rise of mass culture, it's created mass horoscopes. Right. Which are often the reason people say, well, astrology doesn't work because my newspaper horoscope doesn't match me. <laughs> and it's like, okay, cool. You can hang out over there and right. let us do the good work over here. Right. And other people say, oh, I want to know more about this. And they feel called to the vocation to become an astrologer. So I often mm -hmm. say it's kind of like a field of plants. Mm -hmm. And when a cow comes along and starts to chew on the plants, this enzyme shoots out and makes it bitter. And that's what sort of the popular mass astrology is. So they right. go, oh, I don't want that. But then there might be a different animal that comes up and it says, I'll work through the bitter stuff to get to the awesome nutrients inside. <laughs> you know. And so it is really you know, something that isn't necessarily meant to be given right. a higher degree for, or even a master's degree or a PhD or even other kinds of certification. That whole right. entire complex is resting upon a certain social contract that I think mm -hmm. we actually have to put to question. Right. So, Jen, I, I think what's really interesting with what you said is that studying astrology on a tertiary level doesn't actually translate into being a good practicing astrologer. And this is something that I have brought up recently with a group of astrologers who I'm teaching because what I've found to a large degree is that a lot of places that offer an education in astrology, they know how to teach you all of the technical terms that underlie our practice. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty of actually sitting with someone and being able to hold astrological consultative space for them for an hour or an hour and a half or for however long, that piece tends to fall short. So I, I completely agree with you when you say that having a degree of that nature doesn't necessarily translate into actual practice. And I think it's something that we as an astrological community really need to pay attention to because yes, knowing the terms and the techniques and knowing that you know, a solar return is different from a solar arc and solar returns are actually ancient, whereas solar arcs may not be. I mean, all of this is wonderful knowledge, but can you actually sit down and be an astrologer with another mm -hmm. human being is really an important piece. Now, Jen, going back to the issue of teaching astrology, I know that you have launched the, the Catapult Zone, which is an amazing platform where you offer astrological training in quite an interesting way. Can you tell us about that? So I began my own astrology fundamentals class about two years ago and wanted a space off of Facebook to have my students gather because a lot of personal information is shared and I don't like the way that Facebook mines our data. So if I'm telling someone birth dates or if I'm talking about special life events, um, I would feel inhibited myself. And so mm -hmm. because of that, I ended up uh, launching a mighty network. It's one of these uh, sort of off Facebook social networks that's private to only my students. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, well, 
I have a lot of interesting things to teach, but I have a lot of interesting other teachers in my orbit who have interesting things to teach as well. Mm -hmm. So I decided to invite them to join in and, mm -hmm. and I see it kind of like embracing what I have in my chart. So I have a Mars a Uranus conjunction on my midheaven in Sagittarius. And to me, mm -hmm. that's a big middle finger. So I'm thinking <laughs> to myself, you know, I don't care about what, being a professor in a university and I don't care about supporting integrating astrology into higher education because I have problems with higher education in general. But mm -hmm. I also love the idea of teaching really radical, weird stuff and mm -hmm. taking very extreme risks with the teaching so i was like okay i'll teach a class on elemental voids who wants to mm -hmm. sign up they come in they're in the network they can chat zuckerberg doesn't find out universities <laughs> don't matter it's not about getting a terminal degree it's just about right. having learning and right. just doing that kind of you know middle finger in the air sagittarius <laughs> mars on the midheaven with uranus with right uranus. there <laughs> boom let's go um and it's about the fun you know it's all about like when you're having fun and you're learning new stuff it really sinks in and it changes how you see the world so for me it's mostly about fun and I think of that catapult like boom, you know yeah. like we're just kind of <laughs> rubber band you know slingshot being little renegade peeps and and so yeah so the astrology fundamentals class blossomed into what is now the catapult zone and mm -hmm. and it's not limited only to astrology actually I think that I'd like to have more just radical ideas be presented there to people to test out but there's always you know at the heart of it a fundamental astrological focus because it started right. out as my kind of private astrology school even though it's not something that i had intended on founding at that point it was like i don't want to be in astrology school there's so many of those right? right what i'd like to do is just give people a place to go when they want to really get their brain cracked open you know <laughs> and meet really awesome other people that love getting their brains cracked open too Right. So, so Jen, something I've heard you mention is this concept of elemental voids. And I know that what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to start talking about like soon is, yeah. <laughs> is triplicity rulers. But yeah. I just find it really interesting how you, how you juxtapose these different concepts that are from completely different eras of astrology and make them both work. So my big piece that I want to ask you now is how do you, with such an eclectic approach to astrology, uh, come to be interested in a topic like triplicity rulership? It crept up on me. So I was first and foremost interested in fertility astrology. And my colleague, Nicholas Mutz Alsup, is the world's expert in fertility astrology. So in the auspices of my publishing career, which we haven't talked about at all, I started working with Nikki on her book, Fertility Astrology. Mm -hmm. And so we were working with the manuscript itself and it's a textbook. So she's teaching the technique. And this fascinating um, part of her work with the fertility astrology, like the thing that made it tick was triplicity rulers. And I was thinking to myself, how come I don't know about these? What is going on, right? So the idea there is that, um, and, and we're not going to talk about Almutans here, but the Almutan right. would be the planet that is in charge of determining someone's fertile potential. So if you find what the Almutan of pregnancy is, and then you take the triplicity rulers of that Almutan of pregnancy, meaning let's say that Almutan of pregnancy is in Aries. Now you're dealing with a fire sign. So you would take the fire uh, triplicity and you would break that out into the trip rulers. You would be able to tell based off the quality of those three triplicity rulers, the three phases of that woman's fertile life. Wow. Mind blown yet? I wow. mean, it blew my <laughs> mind, right? So it's like, wow, okay, so here we're dealing with somebody who might have, you know, a planet that's super essentially dignified and very angular. And so here's where they did get that teen pregnancy, but they had an abortion. And yeah. then you get a period in the middle of the planet, let's say it's like Venus and Virgo, where there's a little bit of, you know, rulership, but not a lot. And it's, you know, in its fall. So there's this sense of fall from grace and that's secondary infertility, can't get pregnant, IVF, not working, not working, not working. And then boom, the third trip ruler kicks in at around 42 and she spontaneously gets pregnant, right? Because it's in a neutral kind of essential dignity, but it's not as bad as the Venus was and da, da, da. So suddenly you just have this like amazingly precise way of being able to figure out fertile potential. And I thought, okay, this is cool. Let's look at this. And then once I started getting into it, I found out that there's a planet that talks about your magical potential. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to, I have a lot of clients who talk about um, planetary magic and, or, and, or just magic in general, not planetary mm -hmm. magic. Um, 
and they're sort of like, I want to be a better diviner. I want to be a better magician. And I'm like, well, let me tell you, actually, because of triplicity rulers, I can let you understand which planet you should be working with to increase your magical potential because right. some people have it naturally, essentially dignified and angular. And I'm like, you don't need any help. You're fine. And other people have it, you know, maybe it's in detriment and it's like they do need to have some remedial work done so that they can right. cross that threshold so um it's it's something that i do end up incorporating into my consults when i am talking to people and they bring up a subject that i can just in my mind do the math like as they're talking to me and figure out what that trip ruler is and then i look at it and then i start talking to them about it and they go oh, how did you know and just it just completely it's almost like this weird way of combining the precision of horary real time with a natal consult using that person's own essential dignities of their chart straight mm -hmm. up jen let's back up a bit and let people know exactly what a triplicity ruler is because we've we've kind of catapulted straight to yeah, the I heart know. <laughs> straight to the heart of the technique but but let's just back up and let people know yeah. what triplicity rulers are and and where we actually find them within the chart Sure. And, and it's okay to catapult forward and go back because entering a hermeneutic circle like this type of astrology requires there to be a kind of, I can for it. Then, you know, uh -huh, you gotta uh -huh, go, uh -huh. what's it for? All right. Now, how do I find it? What's it for again? All right. Now, how do I find it? Okay. So a lot of modern astrologers know about rulership and fall and detriment. detriment because yeah. Those are the two main essential dignities that did get preserved as we encountered psychological astrology in most of the development of 20th century astrology. As traditional astrology took hold, a whole set of essential dignities got recovered that had not been in common usage because they're a little bit more technical than you would find on the surface of something being able to say, Mars rules Aries and it's in fall and or it's, it's in detriment in Libra. That's easy, right? You can get that. Right. Triplicity rulers are the first of three other essential dignities, the minor essential dignities, that allow us to find out more technical information about the chart. So my introduction to trip rulers came through Bonatti. And Bonatti has a way of describing essential dignity that is a bit like a little story. And if you can remember the story, it becomes very clear to understand how to use essential dignity as mm -hmm. an interpretive tool. So the story goes like this. The ruler of the sign is like the sovereign, king or queen of the sign. The exaltation ruler, which doesn't exist in every sign, is like the exalted guest of that sign because the planet that's the exaltation ruler performs very well inside that house. So for example, with Libra, the exaltation ruler is Saturn because Saturn really likes Libra's house. It's nice yeah. in there, things are pretty and they're orderly and they're very yeah. sort of you know, you've got that kind of strange strictness of let's be nice to everybody and not make any waves. And Saturn's like, uh-huh, that's right. Don't make any waves. Yeah. <laughs> unless I make the waves. But anyway, so we go back and that's the exalted guest. Now, the difference between those two things, I like to draw the, the analogy of um, I, I like paying taxes and renovating the house, right? So the, the king has to actually pay for the, right. the, the land, the tax, property tax, right? The exalted guest doesn't know anything about that. They don't pay the utility bill. They don't pay the taxes. They don't know anything about any of that. They just show up and they enjoy the bath and they enjoy the beautiful dinner and all this other stuff. Um, and if they stay too long and they misbehave, then you get this arrogance that comes with exaltation, right? And you can actually feel that. So an exalted planet can always spill over into that guest that stays a little too long, expects a little too much, is not grateful for all of these things. That's an important part of the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Now, they also can't renovate the house because if they did, if my guest came over and started painting my living room, I would be upset. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> don't do that, right? But, the, but as a ruler, I can, paint my wall, I can paint my walls, whatever I want. I can renovate. I can do anything. So that's that power differential, right? It's important to note. Now, the next step, the trip rulers are like friends. But you can imagine, and so they're not related by blood. That's the next step down from there, the bound or term rulers. The triplicity rulers are like a conglomerate of people that have varying political allegiances because when we get into the nitty gritty and we're talking about something like an earth triplicity, um, we have Mars in Taurus having triplicity rulership, but it's also in detriment, detriment. right? And so there's this weird tango going on between Mars being in a sign of triplicity rulership, so it's got some benefit, but it actually is in detriment, so it has a lot of deficit as well. So it right. saves a little bit of energy, but it also is extremely 
contentious. And so what I can imagine here is this concept of the t push and pull of a friendship. Sometimes we get along, man, she woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. I don't want to talk to her for a week. Maybe she'll be better next week once the breakup's done or whatever that is. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So it's that idea of the, and, and because um, blood is thicker than water, there's also that concept of loyalty. Triplicity rulers aren't that loyal to each other, but they come together for a purpose to work as a community towards whatever they need to be doing um, in the element that they're in. Right. And, and it's very heavily based on sect as well. So sect has to do with whether there's a day chart or a night chart. Is the sun above or below the horizon? And I like to say that that's like teams. So mm -hmm. we've got the sun team and he's the captain and the moon team and she's the captain. Mm -hmm. And then they each have their little like favorite team players and Mercury kind of goes, it gets punted back and forth depending <laughs> on rules, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's this idea of like the teams, you know? And so there's this kind of... Um, challenge and when nikki and i were going over the troop rulers because they're so important for determining fertile potential in her technique we had had this idea that we would get them tattooed on our arm <laughs> so that we could remember what they were and then it took me six years but i actually can i have them memorized and it's <laughs> yeah. not easy because you have to be like okay what's by day, that's the sun, and by mm -hmm. night, it's the what, and what, what. And then Super, I just, yeah. I said, I am going to memorize this if it kills me. And I actually <laughs> teach it to my students. I make them memorize it. Precisely. Um, <laughs> it's actually not hard to memorize if you figure out the uh, hidden logic. And then you know the mm -hmm. logic. And then when you're interpreting, you're just like, you can cut right through. Precisely. So, and, and just to flesh it out, because I don't want to present what trip rulers are without telling about the other two minor mm -hmm. essential dignity mm -hmm. techniques. The bound rulers or the term rulers often were used to calculate things about the length of life of the native in the medieval astrology scheme. Mm -hmm. And they don't include the luminaries. So in that bound rulership, there are five bounds for each sign and each of the, the traditional planets will rule a certain amount of degrees. Now that's not memorizable. If you memorize that, I will give you an award. But I mean, if you have, you did it. I did. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Teach me because I can't do it <laughs> yet. Yeah. 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 Amazing. So yeah. Okay. You, I'm giving you, I'm going to literally send you an award. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to give you a big clap. <laughs> okay. So, but the idea is that they are in Benati's story. This is now kin. So when I think of Venus in Virgo and, and she's in term bound rulership in Virgo, because Venus does have bound rulership in a certain sector of Virgo. Mm -hmm. I imagine that Venus is at her aunt's house. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's actually at her aunt's house. So she's gotten some soup and mm -hmm. she's got a place to sleep tonight. So she's actually not in the bad as a way as we would expect for Venus mm -hmm. to be in fall. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that's my imagination is that Venus is in fall, but right here she has mm -hmm. some help. Her mm -hmm. aunt has stepped in. Her friend is there. If there's triplicity rulership, which there mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like she's got friends, she's got family. There's a right. little bit of help. Right. Now, face rulership, I always laugh because I lived in a very small town in Germany when I was in high school. Because after I got grounded, I said, I'm leaving the country. And I did. <laughs> I won a scholarship to go to Germany for a year. And I lived in the tiniest town of 5,000 people. And wow. when Bonatti talks about face rulership, he said, it's like the foreigner who gets to stay around in a town because of a special skill. <laughs> and my mind instantly goes to the painters and the roofers and the, the various people who were not from that tiny town. Yeah. Got to stick around and, and overcome small town xenophobia <laughs> because they had some kind of utility for being able to do something for the people that were from that place mm -hmm. so it literally saves face right? mm -hmm. so face rulership you get you know you get a little one bit point. of one point exactly you get a, we haven't talked about points but that's okay <laughs> okay so so you get a little bit of a benefit because you have that special talent so then in the consult and i do this with people if i if i see a planet that has face rulership and depending on what it's ruling in the chart i'm like you're kind of known for a little freaky awesome talent you can do about that right yeah. and they're like yeah how did you know and it's like face rulership yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you ever used that in a consult you know specific to the work that i do with horary astrology we have very specific rules for the different levels of essential dignity and when i hear you speaking about medieval astrology it's really interesting for me because in the renaissance this concept of essential dignity was reworked in a different way. So in the example of Venus in Virgo, Venus rules between 7 degrees Virgo to 13 degrees Virgo. Venus in Virgo, in her term in Virgo, the Renaissance astrologer says that she shares in the corporature of Venus. So a planet that is within its own term 
shares more in the likeness of that planet. So Mars in Mars's term is more Marsy, and Venus in Venus's term is more Venusian. Whereas if Venus falls within Mars's term, it becomes a point of description for that Venus. This person is Venus with a Mars overlay or a Mars oh. undercurrent. So it's really interesting for me to see how uh, the to research really how the medieval astrologers use these different levels of dignity because even triplicity rulership, triplicity rulership in Renaissance hoary astrology, once again, is that this person is meanly endued with the goods of this world, which means that mm. they're not really doing in the best shape, but they're also not doing in the worst shape. So they're yeah. kind of right there in the middle. So what I love about what you're saying about Bonadi and even my own reading of Bonadi is that their concept of triplicity rulership, it's, it's, it's different because it's actually a good thing. Like it's actually a better thing, it seems, in the yeah. medieval period than it was in the Renaissance. And I wanted to ask you about that. If you, if you know why it is this conceptualization of the uh, minor essential dignities shifts between these two periods of astrological history. Um, before going there, you said something about the corporature using mm -hmm. terms and bounds and I, I remember that I forgot to say that <laughs> bounds will describe the material manifestation of a thing so let's say you're looking at your client's midheaven mm -hmm. the bound ruler of that midheaven is the material manifestation of the midheaven right so there can be a lot of highfalutin amazing oh it's a fire midheaven you're gonna work for yourself well how what's <laughs> yeah. the bound ruler that's in a Saturn, how Saturn, yeah 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 yeah, you're yeah. Say, okay you have a fire midheaven in saturn's bounds let's talk about discipline let's talk about structure mm -hmm. let's talk about what you've got going on what's your saturn doing where is it where you mm -hmm. know what i mean mm -hmm. so that's telling us the material manifestation of that that's um, amazing so it goes to this idea of the body and the idea of reading the body because the whole thing about kinship is blood, right? It takes blood to give birth. It takes blood to give birth. Your ancestors right. all bled for you. So right. it's like, it's a material thing. It's not about some friendship alliance political thing, right? Right. So, right. But triplicity rulers aren't just about friendships or some kind of alliance matter. Um, Benati's taking from someone called Al Andar Zagar, and I don't know who he is, and I've never seen his text. Andar and Zagar. <laughs> yeah, right. Andar Zagar. What's he doing? Um, I almost feel like we need subtitles here. Andar Zagar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a lot of A's. Uh -huh. um, but but if you read Dorotheus, it actually goes further mm. back, right? And I don't yes. use triplicity rulers in a Hellenistic way because I like my quadrant houses. Yeah, Give me yeah, my yeah. quadrant houses all day long, <laughs> especially if you get an intercepted house with trip rulers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> super fun because and this is true from dorotheus all the way into the medievals uh -huh. um the triple the trip lords tell us a story of the chart right mm -hmm. so and, and i can even get nail dial it down into the topics right so like mm -hmm. i said there was a planet that is showing us someone's divinatory capacity mm -hmm. that's the third triplicity ruler of the ninth house mm -hmm. so the ninth house has many topics and students will go how do i know what's going on Which are the with topics is it mm -hmm. about travel? Is it about religion? Is it about divination? What's going on? Well, the trip lords actually let us have a very detailed map of the 36 topics of the houses mapped out. So going to a kind of easier to read house, the seventh house, it's not just the marital partner. It's also the open enemy and it's the business partner. How do we know which planet in the chart represents which? Right. So Part of the house in general could describe all three of these things. The triplicity rulers describe explicitly, very precisely who these are. Mm -hmm. The first trip lord rules the spouse, if there is one. If that planet doesn't have dignity, do you think there's a spouse? Probably not. If that person wants a spouse and the planet's right. in of trouble, we need to work <clears throat> on remediating that planet. Right. Second trip lord, open enemy. So what I'll do is actually look at the 12th house. The first trip lord of the 12th house is hidden enemies. The second trip lord of the seventh house is open enemy. So I'm like, if that frenemy gets found out, how does their power <laughs> change? Because the planet is not the same. And yeah. so oftentimes not the same. So they yeah. go from being a really powerful frenemy <laughs> who can do a lot of damage to a very weak en open enemy. Right. So it's like, find, ferret them out. Find them. Because right. the minute that they're open, they, they lose all their power. But if you right. let them stay hidden then they're continuing to have power against you. So there's very powerful ways that these can to result in good advice for the client, you know? And so mm -hmm. that's one thing I like about it is that it's a traditional technique that gives us a really capable advice mechanism. 
optimism as right. opposed to a kind of faded like, oh, you're starting this perfection year, so da da da, fate, fate, fate. It's like, no, <laughs> more about like, okay, well, you know, in general, when you collaborate with people, it tends to fail. So stop trying to collaborate <laughs> with people or remediate the planet, you know? Right, right, right. Um, so, right. so, so, Jen, another piece that's important when it comes to triplicity rulers is this concept of the three stages of life. And it's something that yes. it's something that we see in Abraham Ibn Ezra, where he speaks about the triplicity rulers of the second house. The first triplicity ruler rules your your wealth and your your fortune within the first stage of your life, and then the second one is the middle stage, and then the third one is your wealth at the end of your life. Yeah. So I think the pink elephant in the room in relation to triplicity rulers is where do we create these these segments in terms of a life like at what so this is a really good question <laughs> this is an amazing question because okay so with the example of the almutant of pregnancy right right a female bodied person who can conceive in a uterus right is not fertile until her first menses right and after her menopause she's also no longer fertile Mm -hmm. So you would take these years of life and divide them into thirds. Got it. Because it's not her, it's not from birth. That's like a little <laughs> expletive. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and then when you're thinking about, so actually there is a, there is an escape clause in Banati <laughs> where he says, and I think it might be in a few others as well, but the idea goes like this, barring any unforeseen accident that the astrologer can't predict. <laughs> We're going to say it's 30 years each, right, right? Right, right, But if you were to calculate length of life, the theory would be, well, then would you squish and sort of crunch that down? Yeah. If someone dies at 26, do we then look at their life and kind of squish and crunch it yeah. down and see? Or is it one of those cases where had they lived this long, they would have activated that, but since they didn't, that never got activated? Wow. Right? So existential, there's different philosophies. Existential crisis to the maximum. In yeah. yeah. And I think, honestly, I do think that if someone dials down and tunes in, you can feel, especially, so we're, you mentioned the circumstances of life. So the idea of the first house, um, the ascendant triplicities, right. right? Which is different than the satellite triplicities. And both should be looked at because in the case of Anton Scalia, <laughs> that judge, um, yeah. you know, by the objective standards, he was a judge and it was wonderful. But by subjective standards, Moon and Scorpio <laughs> was yeah. the sex like ruler of his third third of life and everyone hated him <laughs> most people hated him. so it was like okay cool you're a judge you have jupiter and sag that's cool but actually you're sort of a jerk yeah. um so it's neat to see how those two things interplay between you know the first third of life second third of life third third of life in in the more functional exterior what can we journalistically say about this person mm -hmm. and then this interior sort of more reputational kind of you know how are they how are they and it's like ah that's a curmudgeon okay mm -hmm. so um, yeah, I think you really do have to worry about um, division according to your own philosophy of time. And I think, honestly, that there are things that can cut us short and that we do have a longer timeline that just doesn't get activated if something mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. So have you found anything within this work of the triplicity rulers that you've had to update for the 21st oh, yeah. century? Absolutely. Let's so the, the, the sixth house is the sticky house and also the 12th, right? So in the Sixth mm -hmm. and twelfth, we get the grab bag. And <laughs> <laughs> so the third triplicity ruler of the sixth house is not only, according to Bonatti, success, or actually, according to Bonatti's interpretation of Al Andar Zagar. Al Andar Zagar! <laughs> Al um, that's, it's, that's too fun. Um, it says success from one's efforts and yep. small animals and pets, which are beasts that you can't ride. Yeah. <laughs> Smaller than. Smaller than the goat. Smaller than a goat, right? Yeah. So apiary, you got birds, yeah. you got vipers, you got every tiny little creature. Um, whereas the third trip ruler of the 12th house is powerlessness, whatever that means, and beasts of burden, i.e. animals that are ridden, including camels, elephants, horses, more expected yeah. things, cows. Um, things that plow a field, right? That idea of work and labor being performed. Um, and so it's like these two are smushed in there and and so it's like you got to kind of figure out how to talk about that now i have used the horse triplicity ruler for a consult before too because someone was into horses so i'm like oh the third trip ruler of your 12th house talks about your horses wow. um but before that 
And the second trip ruler of the six and 12 mm-hmm. talks about slavery and servants, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, we'd like to hope actually in these day and age that we don't necessarily have servants, but it's more about the idea of being an employee or work that is done that is not thanked or acknowledged. And this idea of having to clock in, your time is not your own. You are actually a slave to the wage, wage slaves, we get that idea. So this idea of that type of thing gets put in the sixth because it's work that's not acknowledged. Whereas in the 12th house, it's actually even more burdensome, this type of labor and hard work and this idea of like unwilling, but has to do it anyway, you know, this deprivation of power um, taking place. And so um, those I think have to be updated because we don't necessarily have, I mean, I mean, I guess some people probably actually do still have servants, but it's not the same as it was. Um, Yeah. yeah. And then um, the idea of pilgrimage, when we get to the first ruler of the ninth house, it's for journeys and pilgrimages. Some people do still do that, but it's not as prevalent as it had been. This idea of this like massive perilous undertaking to go to a religious site um, Mm -hmm. is not as common, right? At least not in modern capitalist society. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of the overall usage of triplicity rulers, where would you say the practicing astrologer will get the most bang for their buck in terms of finding their own triplicity rulers? You mean in their own chart? Right, in their own chart. For an astrologer or for anybody? Let's do both. Okay. Astrologers should all look at the third trip ruler of their ninth because they need to find out what their relationship to astrology is. Sometimes it'll be extremely clear, like, oh, it's Saturn in exaltation in the ninth house. What should I be with my life? Oh, wow. Guess what? I'm an astrologer looking at the fact that I'm an astrologer. Yeah. <laughs> or it's Mars, which is in Taurus, which is not in that house. It's maybe in the fourth house. Like, what am I doing? You know, like, mm-hmm. so you got to look at that and see what your relationship to astrology is first and foremost. And the thing right. is, is if that planet is in detriment in some capacity, remediate it become a better astrologer. Yeah. Find out what's weak, make it strong. Yeah. The next thing that I love to do and love to do for clients without even telling them that I'm doing it is read the second house, like you said, about where money's coming from. Because someone will say, I really want to start this thing, but I'm worried if it's going to make money or not. And I'll just quickly look at the trip rulers of the second and I'll see how old my client is. Some of them are 56, some of them are 22. And I'll just look at it and I'll be like, yeah, or no. You know, or your fears are founded, you know, but, and you want to consider this and I'll basically interpret the planet and its position and say, have you thought about making money in this sector, in this field? Oh yeah, I thought about that, but it's a little easy. It's like, okay, well then do it. It's easy. You know, like don't resist and make life hard for yourself because the other idea that this person has is not actually going to be where the money's coming from. Mm-hmm. So the, the third, the triplicity rulers of the second house are timed. They're not, um, the way that Bonatti teaches it, and that's kind of my main uh, source is that the first and the second houses are timed houses and every, everything else talks about the topic in general, except for in the fifth house when he kind of says that the quality of the first, second, and third ruler talk about the quality of life the children of the native will have. But it's kind of a coda. It's not really like a, a forcible rule because it also rules other things like sensual pleasures and honors that the person may receive. So the second house will literally be all about the first, second, and third part of life and where the money's coming from and how much. So it's like someone can have a ruler of that house, like let's say it's the sun um, and the sun is in Leo. That's awesome for that person. But now we want to look at, you know, actually I want the sun to be in Aries. Um, The ruler of that second house is Leo. The sun's in Aries. We're talking about easy money first up, day chart, cool. That next ruler though might be Jupiter and Virgo. How do we talk to that person about that shift in gears? There will be money because the sun is still ruling that second house, but that quality of burning through the money because it's a fire sign on that second house cusp is harder to, to quell when Jupiter can't help. Jupiter wants to help, but there's just not enough. There's a frugality that takes place. So that's how you used it to talk to them. And so you kind of say, oh, there's been a sort of drying up and you know, there was easy this and now it's difficult. And so we have to talk about how to work with that with them. And it's a very powerful thing also to know where is my money coming from? Mm. Do I try to make money by doing musical theater? Hmm, all of my trip rulers for that are in a different house. I'm not actually gonna get to make money through performing. Maybe I need to modify my desire to do that and perform for the sake of it. Instead of expecting that to be a career and getting disappointed when it doesn't work so these are just some of the considerations that i think are immediately useful because 
we all do have to, at least in this version of society, we do need to make money. And so it's important to know where it's coming from and have a targeted approach to mm -hmm. seeing exactly where and how it's coming from. And, and the other also thing that we haven't talked about is when triplicity lords are activated by time lord schemes, then we see those topics happen for the life of the native. So, you know, it's important to use this as a baseline to see what will get activated when, and you right. can make a worksheet. What is Jupiter in charge of in my chart? Okay, all these different topics might be a part of my Jupiter perfection year. Mm. You know, oh, look, my Venus is changing sign in my secondary progress chart. What is Venus ruling in my chart? What could this change of sign in my secondary progression actually be affecting besides the one thing that might be my immediate first impression right you can really fine-tune your interpretations this way and sometimes really blow the minds of clients because they're like whoa that's super specific and totally accurate how did you do that and you're like thank you and <laughs> and you're just reading the rules that's the crazy part is it's uh -huh. like it's all just there it's the follow the rules and it works mm -hmm. so. so that was going to be my very next question jen as to whether or not we would move triplicity rulers through time. So for instance, in the solar return chart, where every year, more or less, we're going to end up with a different sign on the ascendant, or we're going to end up with a different sign on our second house cusp, do we take in those triplicity rulers of our return chart as having interpretational value, or are we sticking with the natal triplicity rulers and just moving them through time? I would stick with the natal. I've never tried to apply triplic triplicity rulers to a solar return in mm. that way. Okay. Um, but that's because a solar return chart to me is an important transit chart, but it doesn't carry interpretive potential in the same way that reading the triplicity rulers of a natal chart does. Um, I would say too, if you think about your life and also where you've made money so far in your life, um, and also, I mean, I'm, and the ascendant, trip ruler changing, right? So I've been alive long enough to feel the shift. I can actually look back and say, wow, that year was the year where it went from this to this, because I can say a marked difference, you know? For me, it was changed from Saturn to Mercury. So I went from being super scholarly, and then it's like, oh, get the PhD, and then boom, even though I was still in school, I was traveling like crazy. And my, you know, so Mercury was obviously in charge because like there was no stopping. Mm -hmm. Whereas before Saturn was kind of like, you will sit in place, you will live <laughs> in this place, you will not move from this seat, you will teach German every day, do, do, do. you know, it's very, very, very Saturnian. And then it was suddenly like, oh my gosh, you couldn't stop me. And like I was ricocheting so much around the world. People were like, I can't even, I don't even know where you are anymore. And I'm like, I don't even know where I am. <laughs> and so Mercury is still in play, right? Um, it. Yeah. So I think you can feel the shift and you can also... And this is true with the fertility work as well, is you can talk to the client about the shifts. You can feel the shifts. Um, and that's a cool thing, I think, is to have it be something that the person can perceive. Like, And it is oftentimes, I mean, if I subscribe to the idea that we do get cut short, so it is around 30 years, more yeah. or less, that, w that we would experience the trip ruler shift. It's the average life expectancy of 90. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you can just talk to the people like, oh, yeah, that changed, you know, and yeah. then just help them. Yeah. Now, the, the other piece, Jen, that I heard you speak about was whether or not, say, Venus is triplicity ruler for someone's fifth house or something, and that Venus changes sign based on secondary progression. Are we looking at the quality or the nature of Venus being first triplicity ruler of your fifth house being impacted? Or how do we take in these predictive methods and apply them to those natal triplicity rulers effectively? So I am adamant about spreading the good news that when a planet changes sign in the secondary progress chart, it doesn't mean that the natal planet suddenly becomes that sign <laughs> or like that sign. All it means is that the year that that planet does that behavior in the secondary progression, that natal planet unfolds its promise in a more robust and visible way, right? So if I have Venus in Libra and Venus goes into Scorpio in my secondary progress chart, I don't have a damaged Venus for the rest of my life. Yeah. What I have is the year that Venus changes sign, a very important story to tell about what Venus rules in my chart. And anything that Venus is doing in my chart, whatever triplicity rulers it is, if it's the first of the fifth or if it's the third of the 11th, um, that becomes the story 
that I tell that 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 is the part of my life that is related to Venus changing sign in my secondary progress chart. So it functions. Let me put it in another way. It functions as a signal. This planet is making a change. That's a signal that the planet's turning itself on in a new way and announcing something. What is it in charge of in the chart? And then I need to read that. What is the announcement here? Now, I do think in the moment of it shifting, you can use some sign significations. So like, for example, if Venus goes from Libra into Scorpio, the story would be of one of a potential worsening of the conditions of that thing. But it's not a permanent thing. It's that in the transition from this to that, something took place that went from a relatively stable, lovely thing into something that became more problematic while it was happening. And then when that year is over and Venus is then fully in the next sign, it doesn't mean that Venus is now in Scorpio forever for that person who's a Libra native. It just means that the year that that happened was representing a certain story and we need to tell that story. Is that how you use them? I, once again, I use triplicy rulers for the three phases of life, and I haven't okay. actually even tried to see what triplicy rulers would do in secondary progressions. So, I mean, this, this entire thing is a revelation for me, and okay. I'm definitely going to, <laughs> I'm definitely going to apply this yeah. because my main relationship to triplicy rulers has been one, either specifically in horary astrology, or two, in terms of in terms of the three parts of life so looking at someone's second house in terms of the three parts of their life in terms of their wealth has been a major mm -hmm. piece for me and then in horary uh something that a lot of people don't really understand about triplicy rulers is that triplicy rulers represent various options <clears throat> so for example if i was in love with three people, <laughs> for example, and I wanted to cast a chart and say, hey, which of these which of these people who I'm in love with is going to be the person of my dreams or who should I actually be dating, then you would use the triplicy rulers to represent person one, person two, and person three. And Bonatti in his book on horary, I'm thinking it's book six or something, but I can't remember. In his book on horary, he lays out this entire method of if you have multiple options that all belong to the same house, you would use the different triplicy rulers to represent those multiple options. And then if a person had five things they wanted to choose from, then you'd go into the three triplicy rulers and then the exaltation ruler and then the blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, it, it gets really I intense. But, uh, but so that's been my real, uh, the, the crux of my use of triplicy rulerships within my own practice. But I definitely do want to take a look now at seeing what happened when my Venus changed signs from Taurus into Gemini and how did that Im impact the houses that Venus rules within my nativity? So thank you so yeah. much for that. Yeah. Now, and um, I, I actually inspired to suggest that this horary technique of three options need not be one of choosing, but a, a lovely way to counsel polyamorous uh, relationship mm. clusters. What do you think of that? <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. I mean... Uh, like yeah. whoa yeah no like wow because <laughs> i mean you know there is a weird sort of heteronormativity to this uh original scheme where you yeah. called it out they missed the first triplicity ruler of the fourth house is the father in Benati or El Andar Zagar, Andar Zagar. There's, no mother. <laughs> there's no mother it's not that the first of the tenth is the mom the opposite uh, of the dad it just yeah. doesn't matter maternity doesn't matter in that rule worship scheme yeah. Um, and so Lily, I think, comes back later and says, no, 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 the 10th house can represent mom if the fourth house is dad. And then if you talk about updating it for modern times and the person didn't have a father, then mother is mother and father in the scheme of how you'd interpret it because she raised the children as a single mom. So she's also then the fourth house in that way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things with the fractured uh, nuclear families in, in right. our modern world and how we compose our family clusters and relationship styles, you know, I think um, using triplicity rulers to read for relationships could be really cool. The, our modern time has fleshed out so much of our human experience in ways that our ancestors and our astrological forebears didn't even have a context for. So I think that there is really important work to be done in terms of us updating our astrology to suit the paradigm that we currently find ourselves in yeah. it, it, it's, it's really special also there's a piece that i always come up with in traditional astrology where you would use you would use the ruler of the seventh house to represent 
the person or your your partner or your lover who you're asking about and then the rule of the first house would be you and then the sun would represent the man because sun represents men in all relationships and then venus would represent venus would be co-ruler for the woman because venus represents women within all all relationships but like i don't have a wife (laughs) and you know like yeah so so how do i fit this concept of sun being co-ruler of the man the husband and venus being co-ruler of the woman in the context where that isn't my reality Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I, I think it's really important for us collectively as modern young astrologers to look at our astrology boldly and demand that it fits the current times we find ourselves in, because if not, we end up holding on to things that have no application to the 21st century. Right. Yeah, I think the concept of natural significator has yeah. to get updated in terms of our experience of questioning nature and <laughs> sensual. Yeah. Um, and this idea of, uh, I don't know, there is a kind of hegemony of, of transmission in terms of this topic is this and this topic is that. And it's like, yeah. well, trip rulers are actually kind of showing us a more faceted picture here. And, yeah. and I like it too, because when you do have three different planets in play, depending on which ones they are, um, you can talk about their relationships to each other. So for example, in the seventh house, you have your, your, marital person the open enemy who's probably like a legal opponent let's just say because open enemy sounds so awkward like oh open enemy boom i'm gonna duel you in the street at noon (laughs) no probably somebody who's you know charging a lawsuit Mm -hmm. and then uh your business partner right it's impossible using triplicity rulerships for those three things to be the same thing in the same way that if you're married and then suddenly you get divorced your your legal partner becomes your open enemy because they are your opponent in divorce court So that planet shifts into power. If you're married to a powerful planet and then that second triplicity ruler has detriment, take them to divorce court and (laughs) run your game. You might actually find that you get out on top. Or alternatively, the person, you know, the planet that represents the first ruler is weak, but then the minute they become a legal opponent, whoa, watch out, you know, get prepared because this divorce is not going to go as easy because that person suddenly gains a lot of power in turning into that. And so you can see the way that these planets relate to each other Um, or even with children or siblings, right? Oh, my one sister never talks to anybody. Well, that planet's feral, you know, she's off there doing whatever she's doing. And the other two siblings are totally chatty. There's a trine. It's fine, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and you can really describe these relationships using trip rulers and it's very fine tuned and it's not as as sort of like, I think of like, um, that game at an arcade where you just smash and it's like, <laughs> yeah. the planet that rules the cusp of the seventh house, bam, you know, the second house, bam. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whack-a-mole astrology. Like, no, nuance, nuance, nuance. Yeah. All right, Jen. So now the next question that I have is really probably the straw that breaks the camel's back, but which house system should we be using in relation to our use of triplicity rulerships i'm glad you asked because i use something called the open house system ah (laughs) the open house system this is neat this needs to be becoming like the thing that people answer because i'm sick and tired of people saying i use whole sign only or i use placidus only or i use porphyry only Mm -hmm. usually because that's the first thing they were taught or it's something that you know becomes comfortable but the, the academic in me is not satisfied with that. And in fact, the, the part of me that loves multiplicity, I want to see things in multiple house systems, but the logic has to be one of this. And it's funny because I think you asked me this when we were getting ready yeah, to yeah, talk yeah. and I was like, oh yeah, um, <laughs> I should answer that I use Alcabicius with this scheme because that's what Bonatti was using. And that was the historically appropriate house technique for this technique, right? So right. that the house system that he used was Alcabicius. So if we're going to use his historical technique we use this historical house cusps right but the lazy astrologer in me has been using this with placidus because that's just what i have on my phone <laughs> app and i haven't reset it and i could reset it but i don't and so and it still tells an amazing story and actually the oscillation is not often that far off and so then you have to go back and say well Jeffrey Cornelius to the rescue. The moment of astrology says that even though the house cusp might be wrong, this person needs to hear this story. So fine, I'm going to write, I'm going to read it wrong, but it's still going to be right, but it won't be, as Robert Hand would say, righter than the right 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he says, Robert Hand says, um, Rob Hand, he goes, yeah. I've never seen a wrong chart work better than a right one, but wrong charts can work. <laughs> so it's fine, right? So it's like, we have to forgive ourselves for these transgressions. Yeah. What I would also say, though, is that I love what happens when triplicity rulers encounter intercepted houses. So, and also, I would never try, even though I know Dorotheus might have used whole sign, I just don't appreciate whole sign with triplicity rulers. It doesn't have the right mouthfeel for me. Now, I'm saying that from my practice. I'm not saying you have to do what I do. Mm -hmm. I'm reporting my feelings about this technique as I've used it in practice. Um, whole sign doesn't have as much horsepower as a quadrant-based system, whether it's Alcabicious or Placidus. The open house system in general, though, is my standard answer to all of this, which is to use the house system that's historically appropriate for the technique in question. Right know what house system fits. So if I'm doing horary, I will change it to Reggio Montanus because that's what Lily did with that technique. If I'm using like Lily horary methods, yep. um, because he drove it to the max using Reggio. If I don't use that, then I'm actually not driving the right car, you know? Yeah. So you've got to just be able to be flexible in that. And anytime anyone says, well, what house system do you use? The historically appropriate one. I use the open house system, yeah. <laughs> not this whole, like, I only use whole sign for everything. It's like, well, why are you even here? What's, yeah. what's with that? You know, like this technique is based off of a, a style of math that didn't use that math. Why are you importing that just because it happened to be something that came earlier, right? right. Um, and I think that does actually put a line in the sand between someone who's truly a professional and is able to hold multiplicity and someone who is just beginning and sort of attached to the first thing or attached to mm. one way and not having the sort of professional acumen to say, this is appropriate here. This is appropriate here. I can switch based off of, I can switch my tool based off mm. of what surgery needs to be performed. Mm -hmm. I've recently found myself using both Reggio Montanas as well as whole sign houses for every client consultation I do, because I have found to my great shock and also slight disapproval that I have loved, I have loved my use of whole sign houses within my practice of classical Renaissance astrology. And I never thought I would. And yeah. I think, I think that's the most brilliant thing that when we integrate things as they should be integrated and when we put them into a workable framework, we find that there is no one truth but everything that we do has the ability to nuance and has the ability to meet someone where they're at in that moment and give them something that they find valid and useful and i yeah. think that's kind of the same thing i hear you saying yeah i think the whole sign quadrant whether it's reggio montanus or placidus or alcabicious mm -hmm. choose choose your your quadrant system mm -hmm. i find the most healing in conversation takes place with the client in talking about the planets that shift houses based off of the whole sign versus the quadrant mm -hmm. because oftentimes they're living from the quadrant immediacy of that reality mm -hmm. people from the outside are seeing them from the whole sign format and if those two things don't match it causes pain and it mm -hmm. causes discomfort and so the healing moment comes for the client in realizing that there is a genuine truth to how other people see them that they're not necessarily aware of and when they become aware of it, it hurts less when they encounter it from others mm. and they're able to integrate more and realize, okay, I'm always going to feel this way because I think my son is in the 12th, but it's actually in the first. And that explains some discomfort I have because I feel exposed and I want to hide, but I'm actually, you know, having these two things be true at the same time. And I think that allows them to understand themselves better and also how they interact with others better. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I like to always bring up the, um, the, differences between the whole sign and the quadrant for them so that they can see those changes and how that changes what they can do in their possibilities with their life too. Right. And so Jen, what I hear you saying is that essentially the whole sign house system serves as the greater backdrop of someone's objective life. Whereas the quadrant house system serves as their own internal visceral experience of their lives. That seems to be the way it plays out in the conversations that I have. The quadrant system is like the inside out, which is why when you read from that, people's eyes get wide and their jaw drops. And like, How did you know? Oh my gosh, wow. Because the astrologer can really get into that lived experience using that symbol system 
Whereas the whole sign system might describe events accurately, but the emotional attachment's not there because that's a description of a journalist kind of saying, and then she went to Peru and from there she climbed the mountain. And it's like, okay, yeah, that might've happened, but in her lived experience, it might've been a totally different experience. And so those two things together can, can make a complete picture from the inside right. out and outside in. Right. And why I find this so important, Jen, is because I think that you know that I practice Uranian astrology as well. And in Uranian astrology, there are six different house systems, which in the beginning, it was like, oh my goodness, what is this? <laughs> you know, but there are six different house systems. And the purpose of these six different house systems is to view reality and to view the person from various vantage points. Yeah. And so, for example, the, the closest thing to the whole sign house system would be the earth horoscope in Uranian astrology. And in that horoscope, it symbolizes who you are in the world and an objective sense of who you are in the world. And that's kind of what I think that I hear you saying in terms of using the whole sign house system, whereas it's this objectification of the person, but there are still more personal vantage points that we can view a person from. And that is the beauty of us looking at the same person from these multiple perspectives. Right. And I think too, you know, we have to categorize what whole sign is versus what a quadrant based house system is. A whole sign and equal house systems are symbolic. Yeah. They are symbolic. They say, okay, your ascendant happens to be in this sign. So now we have this symbolic representation. Yeah. A quadrant based system is using a lot more math. <laughs> to be very specific of you accidentally got born where you were born on earth. Yeah. So now we have, <laughs> cusps that get accidentally placed where they get placed and so the sensitivity of those points is very precise to that person's lived experience of the lived experience of being born in wherever they were born yeah um and so you know symbolic versus based off of geography in a very real sense using logarithms and division of the sky and where the sun is and da 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 you know and then yeah. it's nice when the midheaven floats in whole sign because i can talk to people about having a ninth house midheaven versus an 11th house one but you know functionally lived for them the midheaven is still also fit a 10th house cusp you know yeah. um, from their lived experience so i think it's important to be able to have both in mind at the same time yeah awesome sauce so you have given us a primer on triplicity rulerships, which I think has been absolutely amazing and incredible. And I can't wait to go out and test a lot of the things that you've said within my own charts and my own client work, especially the piece about taking a look at the triplicity ruler of a particular house when it changes sign by secondary progression, because I, I do feel as if I'm about to have my mind blown and I'm going to send you a message as, okay. soon as, as soon as that happens. Now, Jen, is there any final piece you would like for our listeners to know about triplicity rulerships? At the top of my head right now, no, but I would just say start using them. Just yeah. get your hands dirty. Just take your chart apart, jot them down and, and you know, um, just get messy and just figure it out. And, you know, even if you only use a few, like the technique about the second house, it's, you can get a lot of mileage out of it in a consult. So yeah. it should absolutely become a part of the repertoire, I think. Yeah. And now the final piece, Chen, which I think is a really important thing is if people want to learn this method from you of using triplicity rulerships and even some of the things that you spoke about in terms of fertility and astrology, like how can they, when is the next course or how can they get in contact with you in order to get that information? So catapult.zone is the catapult zone website and the fertility astrology is open for enrollment right now, which we'll cover in detail triplicity rulers and how to use them. Wow. Um, on my personal website, celestialspark.com, you can, obtain a copy of the lecture that you attended at UAC yeah. in 2018, along with the Al Mutants lecture. So it's a double <laughs> okay. whammy. Um, you can get both at the same time for the same price. And yeah, and that would be the fastest way to go. Um, but I'd hope people would want to hop in on the fertility astrology class because it's the first of its kind. And it will have, it's a kind of a primer in a lot of medieval techniques. And medieval astrology isn't as popular. There's a sort of surge in Hellenistic right now. Um, but I think it's neat to be able to kind of go to the medievals and see what they're up to. So. Yeah. 
yeah, it, it's really important, the work that was going on during the medieval period. And I, I think that I'm really going to sign up for that course with you, the fertility course, because I love this concept of people bringing back a workable medieval astrology. So you'll definitely see me in the registration. Well, and you also have the results. I mean, you're either pregnant or you're not, you know? So when we're talking about predictive work, it's like, she has pay dirt. She's like, look, I've yeah. gotten 80% of my clients pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> like, it's really true. It's like, this is something that actually is statistically strange. If you talk to medical professionals, the fact that she can diagnose these conditions. And, you know, part of it is also going back to the tradition of medical astrology to diagnose what could be wrong, right? Medical science right now says we don't know what what um secondary infertility is doing with this person we don't we don't know the cause sorry we're just going to call it secondary infertility but astrology gives us is a clearer picture of like oh the lining of the woman's egg is too tough yeah so send her home with a vision of soften the lining of your egg so the sperm <laughs> can get in and it works it's weird it's like this whole reality breaks in front yeah. of you and they, they get pregnant and you're like yeah. oh my god that's yeah. all we had to do is like you know kind of encourage like soften a little bit you know? yeah 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 um, okay speaking of invisible things though yeah yeah i was i was best <laughs> <laughs> okay things was, you can't see <laughs> I, I was just about to go there so jen i know that i know that you are doing a lot of things at the cutting edge even for astrology that some of the work that you're doing is really 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 out there and extraordinary and one of the pieces that you have really emphasized for a number of years has been your work with the astrology that came out of germany in the early 1900s can you tell us about that so it started with speaking german loving astrology, loving the Weimar Republic, saying, I just want to tear out all the pages of all the journals back then and figure out what they were up to. What did they do? Yeah. What did they do? And for the longest time, because of some strange, weird, blind spot of my own, I'm like, I'm just going to leave the Hamburg school over <laughs> there. I don't know about that, right? But I, I yeah. spent thousands of dollars on all of these original books and I started pouring over them. I got obsessed with Elizabeth Ebertine. Um, my translation of her Royal Nativities is coming out any day now. The cover has just been finished designing. Amazing. Um, being designed. So then all of a sudden, uh, Bernadette Brady at the Sophia Center called out for a modern conference on sky mythology. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm finally ready to dig into the Hamburg school because those trans-Neptunians, if that's not a modern sky myth, I don't know what is. <laughs> like this guy sitting around in a trench in World War I, a uh -huh. surveyor, right? Witta was a surveyor, so he was very good at measuring things in very small, tiny ways. You know, mm -hmm. taking it was precise measurement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so he's realizing, oh, this bomb went off, that bomb went off. I'm a little bit bored. Let me take meticulous notes. And the astrology that he had already had in his belt up to that point didn't account for these events. And he's going, but if astrology is going to work, we have to figure out what these events are speaking to. And he was really into midpoints that had come in translation around that time. They were being revived by the astro astrological teachers in Germany. Mm -hmm. So the, the concept of midpoints is actually from the Greeks and it's unabashedly there, right? So he's not saying he's inventing midpoints, but he's beginning to use them. And then he gets the sense that there's something out there called Cupido. And he begins to imagine this first trans-Neptunian planet. And then there's three more. And then his buddy, yeah. Sigrun, comes up with four more. So now we have eight trans-Neptunian planets. And I'm like, what's with that? Do they attach the mythology of Cupid to Cupido, right? No, they don't. And what's interesting is, I dug a little deeper into some of Witta's writings before he even got interested in the trans-Neptunians at all. And he's talking about the nature of color, the nature of sound, the nature of number and mathematics in general. And he has this one essay from 1913 and it extends into 1920 um, when he's talking about sort of the first emanations of his trans-Neptunian idea. And he's talking about color. If you take an ink and you drop a drop on a piece of paper and let it sit over time, Time, it'll spread and these valence shells will start to collect of different micron sized particles of the ink itself and so the heavy particle sits in the middle and the finer and finer particles kind of extend outward from there yeah. and this brings up to him then this concept of valence and then he said something that blew my mind and converted me completely to the trans-neptunians permanently <laughs> he said that the planets emanate from the sun according to this valence shell and the thing that we call the planet is an aggregate lens of that valence shell and where it's active at the moment. 
Mm -hmm. But if you were to take the material of that planet and shift it to a valence shell of a different planet, that material would stop acting like the one planet and turn into the other planet. For example, if you took part of Mercury, the planet, and extracted it from that valence shell and brought it to the shell of Venus, that material that you took from Mercury and now floats around in Venus's valence shell becomes Venusian. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't matter whether there's physical material in the valence shell that we can observe. The valence shell is a mathematical reality. So the transneptunians are actually mathematical valence shells that have reality in mathematical proportion to the solar system centered around our sun. And it doesn't matter that we can't see them because that's not the point. And the whole cosmology of the solar system broke open for me. Like Mercury's not Mercury. Mercury's only Mercury because it's floating around where Mercury is. And if oh. you could just swap <laughs> Mercury and Mars and then Mars becomes Mercury, Mercury becomes Mars because Mars is only Mars because it's floating where Mars is. Precisely. And mind, then I was like, sold. Mind, mind blown. I know. <laughs> mind shattered. And I've wow. never heard anyone talk about it this way because there's no wow. translation of this cosmological principle at the heart of how Vita came up with the Transneptunians. Wow. What we hear is this bad PR scheme of they made up planets, you know, like yeah. I'll make up some asteroids. <laughs> which wow. I did. But, <laughs> but you know, like the mark of a good astrologer in the modern era is make up something, right? <laughs> um, no, but the thing is they're not made up. It's a valence shell, not a reified piece of matter. So everybody is looking at the solar system based on, there's Mercury, here's got a telescope, I can see it, right? There's that piece of that chunk of rock. And yeah. Vita's like, that's really cute. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an energetic orbit around the sun and the matter, like the ink drop, those little particles that gathered there and got gravity enough to become Mercury, only act like Mercury because they're orbiting at yeah, that distance. Uh. Which is why in 2015, <laughs> After all of this mess, and the, the Ebertons and the Hamburg School kind of have this, like, animosity. Yeah. So in 1931, when uh, they got knowledge of Pluto, there was this little footnote in a journal that the Ebertines had published, and it said, so much for those trans-Neptunians, Pluto's orbiting where Cupido should be, ha ha ha. In 2015, <laughs> Vita gets the last laugh because have you not seen that picture of Pluto that comes from... With the uh, heart. With the heart, and it's like, Cupido's there the whole time guys it's there like the valence shell is there wow. at the same time you know and we can have both realities exist simultaneously wow i am absolutely floored because i also read that article and as you and i were discussing earlier it go the, the article is like 10 pages long and it goes through seven pages of color number color number color number so by the time as you reach the last two paragraphs where he actually begins to lay out this, this conceptual vision of the cosmos based on color and number, it's like, that's the entire point. That's the entire point of the work to say that because of these, because of these tendencies inherent within nature, nothing within our cosmos escapes this reality. And but how you just explained it completely shifted the entire thing for me because it's completely mind blowing. And we yeah. never, we never learn cosmology like this. We never learn astrology from this place of the energetic backdrop of astrology. We learn astrology from this place of this is Saturn and this is how long it takes for Saturn to orbit the sun and blah, blah, blah. But we never oh, look, Saturn's bright. It's retrograde. Look at the <laughs> night sky, midnight star, dot, dot. And you're like, okay, cool. That's actually just this weird, tiny little pinprick lens of this entire thing that's always Saturn around us. Wow. It's just that's where Saturn's kind of active at the moment because the material gathered there. And it Precisely. There. Precisely. But, but then, you know, he says at one point, because there is still this materialist basis mm -hmm. where he's going, we don't possess the technology yet to see these other valence yeah. shells and material in them. And honestly, it could be a speck. Yeah. In this cosmology, Cupido could literally just be a speck. It doesn't have to be a planet and a big one. It can just be 
whatever matters in that valence shell that's gathered into whatever point and that's where they go that's why they're so powerful because they do exist yeah. They just don't exist according to the ways that we appreciate because our cosmology is informed by a different mythology. Yeah. So I am, and then, and I think um, the article you have, I don't think is the complete article from the original primary source mm -hmm. um, because my, my uh, reprint of Vita's articles stops short. Mm -hmm. And I believe that might be the source of the translation you were reading. Yeah. So I'm translating that 1913 article because I think people, once they realize the cosmology of the trans-Neptunians, you mm -hmm. can't not change how you see the entire, <laughs> entire reality, honestly, but like the solar system and then also want to use them because it makes sense. It's no longer this, I made up eight planets because I was bored in the 1920s. It's like, no, they're not that made up. They're, they're discovered in this way, you know, because yeah. of this mathematical principle and how you observe reality being very different than the materialist observation of reality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is absolutely mind blowing, and I, like I said, I've I've been exposed to Iranian astrology for years, and I'm currently apprenticing with Gary Christen, who is like the Iranian astrologer ever anywhere. Yeah, and, I love him. And but th this this concept is really really so radical because it breaks apart our thought of these rocks floating around in space it, it breaks apart this argument that we shouldn't consider neptune a planet because neptune is primarily gaseous and it it just it just opens things up to a new reality where we realize that it's not about the rock it's like, not about the rock <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, exactly it's it's not about the rock yeah. and and this takes me back to something that i learned when i was studying vedic astrology was that the word planet in Vedic astrology comes from the word graha, or it's the word graha, which means a grasping point. But this thing with calling the planets grahas means that there are particular wells of potency within space that attract the physical particles and, and matter to it that becomes the planet. Yeah. But it, it begins as a field of gravitation. Uh, so the, the, the rock is the secondary piece. What we're actually speaking about when we view planets as these graspers of energy is that this space, this well of potency, it grasps matter from around it, and that matter becomes the physical embodiment of the planet. But that planet is actually existent or actually has a life of its own beyond the actual rock that we call that planet. And my mind is blown. Yes! <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. All over again. Yeah, and I didn't even know that, but it's completely in congruence with this. You know, it's in, it's it's totally coherent with what Witta was saying too, you know. And I love how when we observe reality, different cultural frames can come to the same essential why well, I don't like that word the same principles yeah. based off of observation and just sitting with the material thinking about the material being with what we can see and and just yeah the lineage is so fantastic that it can just wow. have both both different traditions having this like commonality and <laughs> I would love to come back and talk more about that because I'm not done with the translation and um it once it gets out there I want everyone to read it and I want to have larger conversations about this you know this cosmology is like my favorite thing right now in terms of my astrological research. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Let's just end it. You yeah, know? No, no, like, <laughs> like, what can you do? Like, <laughs> like, like, wow. This, this, this is valence this, shell. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is you amazing. know, what I mean, yeah. this has been like, like going on, going on. Have you watched that movie? The, the last Mimsy? No. Oh my goodness. Anyway, you should watch it. But it's like going on this complete kaleidoscopic journey through the cosmos, all from the comfort of my own home with you right now, because yeah. that, that imagery that you painted, it just completely changes everything about everything. Doesn't it make you want to just like say, oh, I just want to take this little chunk of mercury and test it, you know, and like put it in <laughs> <laughs> different... <laughs> like what does it really do that like does it yeah. turn around when it gets out to mars you know like <laughs> i just yeah it's just yeah the thought forms are so potent with it you know and it just makes perfect sense once you ground yourself in that vision that he had you know how can you not get curious about them and want yeah. to see what they're up to you know yeah
I think that Alfred Witte, he was definitely one of the unsung heroes of 20th century astrology, and there needs to be more talk about him. We need yeah. to revive his work because he, and we, we borrow so heavily from him, the composite chart, the, the midpoints, the midpoint listings, and all of these things, we borrow so heavily from his work, but no one is really calling his name. So yeah. Jen, I'm really so grateful from the bottom of my heart and i'm sure that the larger iranian astrology community and the symmetrical astrology community is also grateful because you have completely brought something brought a piece that that no one has spoken about to us and thank you so much yeah yeah you're welcome i hope to finish that translation soon so we can yes. talk more in detail about it because I want you to read it yourself you know like yeah. that's part of why going back to the very beginning why I learned German because I knew there was something there was a weird thing I felt in my heart of like I need to become fluent in German so that I can go into the sources in German astrology there's something there you know that I have to bring back so that is part of my work as a professional is always in tandem with seeing clients and teaching is also just making sure I do the cultural retrieval. You know, my ancestors are German and there's just something there for me to always honor them and honor the language of astrology and just bring back these morsels, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's, that's, it's good for everyone, you know, mm -hmm. so it's sort of that principle. Mm -hmm. I totally love your own kaleidoscope of, of work and just the, the erudition that you bring to the table with your work with the mathematical techniques of Uranian. I mean, I'm not even, I can sometimes not even tell right from left. So I definitely <laughs> respect that. And, uh, and yeah, it's just been amazing talking with you today and I can't wait. I feel like we could keep going for another five we, hours. We so <laughs> I think we should probably yeah, stop yeah, here. Yeah, 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 but, we um, but you know, uh, yeah, it's just been so wonderful to, to speak with you today. So it has thank been. Thank you for having me. It has been. Thank you so much, Jen, for coming. And Jen, please give us your website once again, both of them, the one okay. for Catapult Zone and the one for Celestial Spark, so that people can get in contact with you and so that people can study with you because you have so much to teach and so much to share. So what are your websites again? So Catapult Zone's easy. It's www.catapult.zone. Mm -hmm. And my personal website is celestialspark.com. Awesome. And Jen, also talk to us, uh, give us the, the date again for the fertility in astrology course that you're offering through Catapult Zone. So that one has two sections depending on enrollment because there are people around the world who want to take it. So there's a Sunday section and the Tuesday section, and that will begin in June and stretch on into July and all of the specific information is on the website, but there's more courses coming. And I always teach a fundamentals course, a 16 week semester of astrology in the fall. And I treat it like a, an academic experience in exile, right? So we're learning the taboo art of astrology together <laughs> as if it were a seminar, the feeling of a university seminar without any of the baggage or administrative fees. So yeah, yeah. That'll start in September. Awesome. So, so everyone, if you want to get in contact with Jen, please do check out her websites and I will have all of that information in the description below and you don't want to miss out on it because as you've seen today, Jen has so much to offer us and i'm definitely excited to enroll in one of jen's courses and you should be as well everyone this is a wrap for today thank you all so much for tuning in once again to the oraculos true divination podcast and if you want to find out more about me and the work that i do please do feel free to check out my website at www.tarodharma.com where you can also check out my library of past podcasts and i do hope that this isn't going to be our last podcast with dr jen zart because i definitely want to talk to you about everything wow. so <laughs> It'll happen. Yeah. It's gonna happen. <laughs> awesome. Thank everyone, you so much. you're so welcome, Jen. And everyone, please do remember to like and subscribe to this YouTube channel if you want to be in the loop and get more amazing content from more amazing astrologers. And if you want to see Jen's art here on the show again, please do like and subscribe. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for joining. Be well, stay safe, and until next time.